Good afternoon. Welcome to the Riverwood Conservancy's latest webinar. We are talking to the expert gardeners once again. They're back by popular demand. We had such a great turnout uh, after our first webinar with Douglas and Gail that they graciously agreed to come back and show us the garden once again. And uh, hopefully we won't have as much uh, roaring in the background as we go through the rest of the webinar. Uh, but uh, things are going to be a lot more in bloom compared to our first run, uh, which we did, I think it was back in April. Uh, again, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Rashid Clark. I'm the Marketing Specialist at the Riverwood Conservancy. Uh, just a bit of housekeeping off the top. If you have questions for Douglas and Gail at any point throughout the webinar today, please drop them into the Q&A panel in Zoom. We'll get to as many questions as we can at the end of their garden tour. And of course, as we are at the Riverwood Conservancy dealing with the challenges of COVID-19, including the loss of uh, some funds from uh, many events which have been canceled this year, if you do have the financial ability to make a donation, of course, we would very much appreciate your gift. You can give at the riverwoodconservancy.org. So first of all, uh, Douglas Markoff uh, completed his graduate studies in botany at Clemson University in South Carolina and at the University of Toronto. Uh, his professional career has included positions as a greenhouse manager, nursery manager, college instructor, and of course his current position as the executive director for the Riverwood Conservancy. And Dr. Gail Kranzberg is a professor in the engineering and public policy program at McMaster University. She completed her PhD at U of T as a freshwater scientist, has authored over 200 publications, authored and edited nine books, and when not at work, she enjoys her husband, camera, and her garden. Of course, we're gonna see that garden today. So uh, Gail, Douglas, I will throw things over to you. Oh, welcome everyone. Welcome back to our garden. Today is uh, June 18th, 2020, and the garden has certainly advanced from our webinar in the end of April. So I'm standing in front of one of the uh, anchor plants in our front garden. Uh, this is Cornus Cusa, or Chinese dogwood. And what's uh, lovely about this time of the year is that it is full of these white flowers, but they're not actually flowers. These white structures are actually modified leaves called bracts, and the flower is actually this little uh, piece right in the center. Sort of analogous to uh, the bracts that you find on a bougainvillea or the ever popular uh, Christmas poinsettia. So cornus cusa or Chinese dogwood. So today we're gonna to be walking around the rest of the garden. And what's interesting about our garden is that we have a diversity of garden types here. There are shade gardens, sun gardens, semi-shade gardens, and we're gonna see examples of all of them. So right here, we're standing in front of our shade garden, primarily because of the neighbor's large Norway maple. But even here, there's a tremendous amount of plant material that you can and grow from hostas to perennial geraniums uh, to uh, alliums, which uh, about a week or two ago, they were just fabulous. These big purple blossoms, which also come in white. But at this time of year, you can have other types of alliums in your garden. One is this funky allium called Allium schubertii, and then this weird allium called Allium nectoscortum. But again, a lot of interesting plant material. In fact, one of the more rare plants here is this variegated Solomon seal. Most of the Solomon seals that you see grown in the nursery are total green. But if you can pick up uh, one that is variegated, which means it has both green and white, then do so. Again, a really nice brown cover perennial. And there's some other interesting grasses here and other perennials. So we're now moving over to the uh, a part of the garden that has a little bit more sun. And one of the dominant plants here is the Canadian service berry. This is one of our native uh, Canadian shrubs. Every year it is full of white blossoms in May, which then give way to a tremendous amount of fruit, which the robins are very, very eager to see. In fact, every day the robins have been stopping by, uh, checking out the fruit and seeing whether it's ready to, uh, to eat. Another unusual plant in our garden is this. This is a dwarf dawn redwood. In fact, you'll see uh, throughout our garden that we do have a small collection of 
weird dwarf evergreens. Uh, another word for evergreen is uh, conifers. So again, a dawn redwood. No garden would be complete without a Japanese maple, now in its full glory. This happens to be a red weeping Japanese maple, uh, Acer palmatum dissectum. And most people think that Japanese maples are, are tender, but they're actually hardier than most people think. They are disease resistant, fungus resistant, and they are just so graceful and beautiful in the garden. They come in red, they come in variegated colors, they come in green. But again, a must have for any garden. Here is another section of our shade garden, um, full of perennials, and we call them Gale's Coneflower Garden because a tremendous number of uh, coneflowers in the garden, including our native uh, Echinacea. Moving along, there is uh, more coneflower. Uh, this is a, a remnant of bellwort. So the bellworts had these beautiful yellow nodding flowers several weeks ago. And of course, they're all finished right now. Uh, a geranium, a perennial geranium. Moving along, one of the most reliable perennials in any uh, garden is uh, this, uh, Salvia nemorosa. And you could already see that it is supporting uh, pollinators. A variety of bees are already around. Oh, there's our, uh, there's Kodakat making his, uh, his debut. Part of the garden is this anchor. This is uh, a Katsura or Cercidophyllum. And what's interesting about this plant is that the leaves have this beautiful heart shaped, um, they're beautifully heart shaped. And in the fall, they turn this vibrant orangey golden color. The other interesting thing about the Katsura tree is like a few trees, there are both males and females. Who would have thought? <laughs> so now we're going into one of the uh, sunniest part of our garden. In fact, uh, probably the most extreme of the environments. This is where we have our cactus and succulents. So there is a small patch of portulaca in the front, which is a annual followed by uh, different varieties of sedum. And here we have a patch of uh, native cactus. Yes, Canada has native cactus. This is a uh, Opuntia humifusa or prickly pear. And just look at all the flower buds that are gonna be opening over the next uh, few weeks. So unlike um, a lot of plants, the cactus will literally lay down during the winter and it gets covered by a ton of snow, as you can imagine. And then as the days get longer around March, the pads will begin to lift, they go erect, and then they'll start putting out uh, the flower buds, which will be followed by other leaf buds. Uh, there's a blue sedum here, which is just about to come into flower as well, and it'll be covered with uh, yellow flowers. Again, beautiful. Again, this is a hot, dry, very, very uh, demanding area. Uh, we've tried other perennials and of course none of them worked, uh, but once you start working with the succulents uh, and the cactus, it's amazing what you can grow here. So for you to ponder, all cactus are succulents, but not all succulents are cactus. So more perennials. Uh, there's an example of a Allium shiverdii under a, um, a centoria or a bachelor button. And you can also see the remnants of our large gigantic uh, alliums. And what's so cool about this is even after the flower is finished, you still have this, this uh, architectural star-like uh, structure. And we use them in a couple of different ways. Uh, we can cut them off, dry them upside down and put them into arrangements. And then in, in our special needs uh, enabling garden up at Riverwood, the volunteers have actually spray painted these and then placed them in the garden. Very, very funky. We do that. Very for, sensory, very sensory stimulating. We do that for our Christmas display too in the house. Uh, some other funky uh, plants here. This is a dwarf weeping spruce and a hinoki cypress. 
Oh, getting back to the cactus just for a moment. Here's an example of propagating uh, the Opuntias. So what I've done is in order to keep the plants off the driveway and from us from driving over them, I prune off the pads and then let them dry for a few weeks. And then I put them into a very loose, sandy mix of soil. And in no time, you'll get roots. Very easy to do. So we're now going uh, up towards the house and we're gonna make a quick right before we continue on in this direction. Just to show you that not all gardens are uh, in the ground. You can actually have a lot of containers. So Gail is just gonna pan over here. And you can see uh, as an entranceway leading into the house, there's a variety of containers. These are mostly annuals, but you can certainly have perennials there as well. We also have a very nice vine this is climbing hydrangea, and every year it is covered with these fairly large, flat, white, whitish beige uh, flowers, which also attract, attract uh, quite a few pollinators. Very interesting plant, a bit rare, but if you can ever find it, buy it. This is a weeping purple beech. Most beech that people are familiar with are fairly upright, both um, uh, different colors, but green or purple or variegated. But this happens to be a weeping form. And what's interesting is that it stays at about uh, the six or seven foot height. So if you've got a nice little corner where it gets a uh, sufficient light, a weeping purple beach. Another container. Just, um, just a little tidbit. We do have a fair bit of containers. And like you, you might have containers on your porch or your balcony. What we, what we do, and what I would suggest that you do, is we will elevate the pot. So in all cases, if we have a pot on the ground, it has a tendency of having that drainage hole get plugged. So we always lift the plant, the pot, just a little bit to keep it off the ground and allow for drainage. So here's an example of uh, other plants that we've uh, planted in a container. This is tomatoes. So Gail ran out of space in her garden, but we had all these extra tomatoes. And since Riverwood was closed, we couldn't give them away. So we decided to plant them in containers. So this is a clay pot, but you could use plastic. You could use a blue bin. You could plant tomatoes. You could plant herbs. You could do potatoes, whatever you'd like. Oh, and before we leave, I just wanted to show you that you could also plant beans understory in your tomatoes. So we're going up the, uh, what we call the, the driveway garden, uh, classic name. Um, here we have irises. Here we have uh, the remnants of a tree peony, uh, just finishing up. <clears throat> and what's interesting about our garden, like many gardens, is that you try to plant it such that there's always something in flower. So as the irises are finishing, these are bearded irises, right behind them will come the phlox. This happens to be uh, the hot pink phlox, and they get about uh, five feet, and they are so vibrantly pink. In fact, there are times you could stare at them and then look away, and all you see is pink. That's how vibrant they are. Again, a few other peonies, this is, um, I don't recall the, uh, the name of these. This is uh, a pink, and this is the classic white. Peonies have been around forever. In fact, I suspect a lot of you have parents and grandparents who still have their original peonies. Here we're passing a sort of an interesting plant, very long, leafy plant. Well, what's that? Well, that happens to be horseradish, which Gail harvests every year to make Horseradish. Horseradish. <laughs> and in fact, it's really good as a condiment with uh, meats and fish and vegetables. And, uh, vegetables. We have uh, a couple of figs. We're experimenting this year for the first time actually planting the figs in the ground. And you'll see why when we show you the big fig. But we've never planted them. We've always stored them on the ground or in the greenhouse. But this year for the first time, we're planting them outdoors. And over winter, I'll be building a little box, an insulated box for them. 
So we're going down in, down our side garden. Again, if it's shade, we've got uh, some hostas and uh, some ligularias, which we'll show you. It's lined by this beautiful uh, path of Canadian anemone, which is a native Canadian wildflower. We're passing under a white pine, which I've, over the last um, 11 years, have been uh, cultivating to form an arch. Normally, the white pines are these large, stately uh, conifers. In fact, the uh, Ontario's provincial tree. Uh, but we've decided to uh, create this arch. Another plant, which if you're interested in attracting pollinators and particularly monarch butterflies, is this. This is the Joe Pye weed. And Joe Pye weed comes in a few different species or cultivars. <clears throat> and in another um, month or so, it will be covered with butterflies and other uh, flying pollinators. Each year we will actually tip them. So one of the garden tip techniques is to tip the plant. What, and we're gonna show you on another plant what that means. But basically you just remove with your, your two fingers, you remove that growing tip. An inch or so will do it. And what that does is it, well, if you don't tip it, let's start that way. If you don't tip it, you're gonna get a long stem which has a cluster of flowers. One stem, one cluster. But by tipping it, you then allow the side branches to develop, which normally are dormant. And as those side branches develop, in fact here, Yale pinched them two weeks ago, you can already see these new branches starting. So instead of having one branch with one cluster of flowers, you can have six with six clusters of flowers. A very good uh, technique uh, in gardening, especially if you want to increase your flower production. The other thing, if you don't pitch them, sometimes they get long and leggy, the rain comes, the next thing you know is that everything's flopped down, lying on the ground. One of the points that we wanted to raise today is that, yeah, plants are great for flowers, annuals, perennials, trees, but some plants are wonderful just for the foliage. Here's an example of, of one such plant. This is Ligularia. And towards the end of the summer, they put out this very funky, deep orange flower, which contrasts so much with the purple of the leaf. But somehow it works. This is a, a runcus or goat's beard, also a magnet for pollinators. Um, now, I don't know if you can see this with the camera, but it is full of flying uh, beasties. It's a technical term. The technical term. Another uh, Schubertii, Allium Schubertii, and a couple of other examples of the Ligularia, also with different architectural leaves. So again, not all perennials uh, do you select for the flowers, sometimes just the, uh, the, uh, the leaf. In fact, you can just begin to see uh, the beginning of the flower. This one will have a yellow flower, whereas the other Ligularia is a funky orange. The roses are just now starting. In fact, as I'm standing here, I, I can already smell uh, the, the distinct scent, the distinct fragrance of rose. This happens to be Pink Dawn. This is its first crop of flowers. When the flowers fade, we remove them with our secateur, our hand pruner, and you'll get um, a good three or four uh, sets of flower blooms. Here we have, so not only do we have uh, plants that are ornamental, but we do a fair bit of uh, food horticulture. So this is a raspberry, and you can see that the raspberries are beginning to uh, flower, and they're delicious especially in cereal or jam. This is a really interesting plant. This is um, Bapticia. And they come in a couple of different forms. This happens to be, I forgot the species name, but this is the purple flowering one. And what's interesting about the plant is that it does have um, some very nice uh, leaf even after it flowers, but more so after the flowers fade 
and the fruit is produced, the seeds inside are loose. They, they, they loosen. And as you shake the branch, you can hear the seeds rattling. And we use them in our enabling garden because they're extremely sensory, as you can imagine. You can almost make a musical instrument from them. Here we have um, another really interesting plant. This is a, a dwarf ginkgo, where normally the ginkgos will get um, up to 60, 70 feet in height. Uh, this is a, a cultivar and it is dwarf. It shouldn't get any more than four feet uh, tall at the, at the most. Here's a, here's a columbine. This is the uh, native columbine. Columbines walk around the garden. You can plant them in one spot, but they will seed and they'll walk around the garden. And you can always tell the native one because the native columbine or Aquilegia has a, a sort of orangey red color. Okay, so we're now in the backyard. A uh, good amount of sun, as you can see. And I'm going to take the, the camera because we are approaching Gail's vegetable garden. And Gail's going to take us on a tour of her vegetable garden. Thank you, Douglas. Um, if you were with us in April, you remember when I put little peas in the ground. Well, this is my pea vine. Uh, it's a climbing pea. Obviously, it's great to trellis it, because otherwise it sprawls on the ground and just get eaten. This should have enough peas that will go all the way until August. Um, also in the garden, a whole bed of greens. So these are salad greens, radishes. You can see the little frilly things over there. That's carrots. This is dill. This is kale from last year that grew out again. And we don't want it to flower too much. This is broccoli rob. Um, and again, it's starting to go to flower because of hot weather. So this is dinner tonight. All these flowers will be dinner tonight. As we go further into the garden, what I want, these are just bush beans, very simple, yellow and purple bush beans. But you see some new ones coming. So what happens is I plant half of it now and then about, or this was about three weeks ago, and then about a week ago. So every few weeks you want to put a few more in so you have a constant crop. Um, obviously everybody has to have their tomatoes uh, and I have about nine varieties of heirloom tomatoes that we start in the greenhouse by seed from cherry tomatoes that are black and yellow and orange to black tomatoes and pink tomatoes and yellow and red tomatoes and green German stripy tomatoes. The interesting thing about this area is that I don't know why people buy squash plants in the nursery Really, you just put the seeds in the ground. Put them in the ground about a month ago, and that's zucchini or yellow squash. This is going to be butternut squash that'll climb up here. And of course, we've got rhubarb. Everybody, if you have a sunny spot, please get rhubarb. It's just the most magnificently delicious thing you can grow. So we're, <clears throat> we're now going around the, uh, the rest of the garden. Uh, this is a larch, a weeping larch. Uh, to my left is a yew. Now, yews are not uh, unusual, uh, but what is a question that I get uh, fairly regularly is, well, I've got a yew in evergreen, but when do, I, when do I prune it? I have no idea when to prune it. Um, so a good rule of thumb is we prune it uh, late winter, uh, very early spring, um, after we see the new growth, and then we uh, scale that back with a, a, a sharp pair of uh, pruners. And as a result of the pruning, uh, that releases, as with other uh, plants, it releases those dormant buds. And you could already see that we're getting all sorts of new growth uh, coming up from where we cut. Another plant in the garden is this. This is fig. This is uh, the Italian fig. And in, during, in the summer, around August, we're going to get these beautiful fruits, which when they turn slightly purple, uh, you know it's time to harvest. And inside is this beautiful, sweet, delicious red flesh. 
We've also placed uh, some uh, Spanish moss around it, which I've been growing for quite a few years. Uh, Spanish moss is actually a lichen. It's a, um, it's a symbiotic relationship between a fungus and a algae, uh, but it forms uh, this little cascading uh, plant. Um, and interestingly, every now and then, birds will come by, take a piece of it, and they actually use it as nesting material. Um, we've got a, one of the most gorgeous plants in the garden. This is a tricolor beech. And the tricolor beech, uh, you can see why it's called tricolor. It's got uh, green, there's a dark plum to it, and it's got that beautiful uh, pinky red uh, tissue as well, which against the blue sky is just, it's like an artist's palette. Somebody should capture this on, uh, on canvas. Now you may remember uh, if you were with us uh, during the April webinar, that, uh, that we have a couple of plants here. This is a uh, viburnum burkwoodi. Uh, sorry, no, this is the viburnum double file viburnum. And then a Korean uh, lilac. Well, they were just taking over the garden. So I decided to prune them, but prune them radically. So what was a 10 foot shrub was scaled back to three feet. And even with that kind of radical pruning done at the right time of the year, uh, it will uh, begin to put out a new growth. And that's an indication that it's got a really good uh, root system as well. We're just gonna scale around the vegetable garden once again, because Gail wants to show you a couple of other items in the vegetable garden. So if you have your onions that go over winter and they come back the next year, they might do this. It's called bolt. This is not good. You do not want this to happen. <laughs> this is a first year's growth and I'll, these can mature into nice big bulbs. These are gonna get cut today down to the very base. You can eat it, it's definitely edible, but if you let this flower, you're gonna destroy any onion that's left in the soil. So you wanna take those away. In here we have some eggplants and some peppers. You can actually see these are sweet little red peppers and they're already starting to form so they'll be gorgeous and sweet like candy. I don't know what this is. It decided to come. I don't know what, what kind of squash it is, but why not? It's an adventurer. And in our, in our garlic patch, you have all these curly things. These are garlic scapes. These, if you let them flower, will destroy the garlic that you're trying to grow. So. These are all coming out today as well. You cut them right from the base, take the whole thing, take this fibrous where the flower would be, take that away. And this you can saute, you can use it as garlic, you can make it into pesto. It's absolutely delicious, but you need to take it off. Do not let this flower. We have some parsley over there. We have a cat over there. Yes, we do. <laughs> and uh, and, and just, to, just adventitiously, a number of different herbs. So I've got rosemary, I've got tarragon, I've got a double colored sage. This is a second year parsley plant, some dill that's coming up all over the place. So welcome to another part of our perennial garden. <clears throat> What's interesting about this garden is that we used to have a old apple tree. In fact, we're in an area of Mississauga called Applewood, and it was one of the first um, housing complexes in Mississauga that was done by um, the Ship family. And on every uh, property, there were apple trees. Well, there, used, there was an apple tree here. Unfortunately, uh, from age, uh, we had to take it down, plus it was uh, very scabby. So we replaced the apple tree with a very unusual plant called Stewardia. It's been struggling. I've had to prune back the leader a couple of times. It's just on the edge of its hardiness. But I think as gardeners, that's part of our role is to try to push the limits a little bit. So we have an understory of the, by the Stewardia, of a variety of perennials. So uh, one of our favorite perennials is the coral bells. Now there's been so much hybridizing with coral bells or hookera 
and we do have a couple of other varieties, but I always enjoyed the, um, the species hookera or coral bells. They have these lovely flowers and they just keep going and going. Um, and then we noticed this morning, boy, look what just popped up. This is a corydalus. They come in uh, several different colors. This happens to be the yellow one and slowly but surely it will fill the spot. Normally it's in a rockery, um, and I have to admit, I didn't plant it there. So they do tend to walk around. So I mentioned the, um, the tipping earlier. So this is an example of a plant, and we're gonna show you how to tip the perennial. This happens to be a fall aster. So when you tip, again, you take your two fingers, or you can use a pruner if you'd like, and you take off the first inch or so, and you just take, you just tip it. You just remove it, just like that. And in a couple of weeks, a couple of weeks, what will happen is just below where you tipped it, all sorts of new growth will come out. So again, instead of having one stem with one set of flowers, we're now going to have one, two, three, four, five new stems just here, so 5, 10, 15, 20. So instead of four, we're gonna have 20 stems, each with a cluster of flowers. And these fall asters are just fabulous for attracting um, bees and other flying insects, uh, particularly during the fall. Another plant that we have here is a uh, lady's mantle. Lady's mantle is really interesting because it's one of the only plants that have these uh, chartreuse uh, colored flowers. And after the flowers fade, you still have interesting foliage. We also have an example of a non-native columbine. This is a, a yellow flowering uh, cultivar, much taller than our native uh, columbine. And it also will, uh, actually this one will not produce seed, but the native columbine will produce seed in these structures. So if you're interested in propagating your native columbine, it's very, very straightforward. Lots of information online uh, for you to follow. So again, if you were here, if you were with us in late April, you would have, I would have shown you um, our Mukdinia. Remember it had these white flowers all over, uh, several of which were damaged by that week's late evening frosts. So the flowers have faded now but you're, you're left with these wonderfully architectural leaves. So remember, one of the lessons here is that you don't necessarily have to choose the plant because of the flowers, but rather the foliage uh, is interesting. So it could be foliage, it could be texture, it could be height. There's a number of reasons why you choose uh, the plants that you choose. Hmm. Oh, we just had our first flower. So on cue, this is our first, uh, Evening primrose, uh, this is a native plant, also attracts um, a lot of pollinators uh, to the garden. <clears throat> evening primrose, why is it called evening primrose? Well, because during the evening, it begins to uh, close up. Very prim. Uh, it's surrounded by uh, geranium. So here's a little tidbit. The geranium that we typically refer to as geranium, a big leafy plant with a big red flowers, although they do come in a variety of colors. Those are not geraniums at all. Years ago, someone called it a geranium and the name stuck. They're actually pelargonium. The actual geranium is this native geranium, which comes in a, a variety of colors. Great ground cover. Oh, here we have a peony, one of the last remaining uh, peonies. Gail has been, we also have a few uh, bonsais here. Uh, these are on the order of 25 to 30 years old. <clears throat> there is a pines, a juniper, a form of uh, crassula or jade. And then we've been growing this uh, Japanese maple, which is an offset from this Japanese maple. So I collected the little seedling one year grew it on, and then Gail 
uh, began to shape it uh, to fit uh, this bonsai. Isn't that lovely? You may also remember last time we had Montauk daisies that I was propagating for Riverwood from cutting again. And in just a, a, a few short weeks, I mean, just look at that. That's ready to pop out of the pot and put it into uh, Riverwood. And what's really nice about these Montauk daisies is that it has to be one of the last flowering perennials. It's got this beautiful, as the name implies, uh, a white daisy with a pink, uh, sorry, with a yellow uh, center. Again, very late. So the Montauk daisy, the toad lily as well. That's another plant. We didn't show you the toad lily, but again, if you're looking for late fall plants, the Montauk daisy, toad lilies, mums are fabulous. So we're going to, it's another container. We're going to go into the uh, greenhouse for a little while. Oh, see, we had a couple of uh, gills left over tomatoes. So we decided, well, why don't we put it into uh, this funky container? And already it's growing well. So come on into our greenhouse. Welcome. A little warm in here, but all the windows and the vents are open. <clears throat> I'm going to take you on a tour, but I just thought I'd show you something here. I'm starting some pole beans inside because I have a lot of damage from animals trying to eat little, these little cotyledons. So we're going to try and experiment here, some in the ground and some in these peat pots. And you just put the whole peat pot in the, in the ground. You don't transplant them. So we're going to scan around the greenhouse. For those of you who are interested in uh, weird and wonderful plants, uh, these are plants that we've been collecting uh, from around um, our various visits here and there. And uh, then I bring them back into the greenhouse, repot them. Because, of course, you can't bring any plants across the U.S. Canadian border that have uh, soil around its roots. So whenever I buy a plant from the United States, I remove the soil. And then once I get back uh, to the house, I repot it. And again, lots of uh, really interesting plants uh, in the greenhouse. And the last time we were here, of course, we couldn't even walk through the garden, or through the greenhouse rather, because it was full of the tropical plants, which are now uh, outside. So just one last plant that I wanted to show you. Although it hasn't fruited yet, I'm very optimistic that one of these years, this will flower. What is this? Well, can you believe it? This is pomegranate. And I've been growing the pomegranate from a little cutting over the last number of years. And maybe one of these years, I'll actually get one fruit. But it's fun to try. So I think with that, um, we're going to uh, end the, uh, the garden walkabout, the garden webinar. Again, you're welcome to um, through Rashid, ask any questions that you have. Uh, you can even ask some questions of us uh, over our website and I'll definitely get back to you that way. The other um, resource that you may want to consider is the Mississauga Master Gardeners. They have a site which also, if you want to submit a question, they'll get back to you. So lots of uh, sources of information. So we're gonna go out of the greenhouse because it's about 95 degrees in here. We're going to go, we're going to stand right here in front of a little patch of Spanish moss. And then um, if there's any questions, we're happy to answer them. If we don't know the answer, we'll, um, we'll get back to you on that. You're not so, just going to make, just gonna make up an answer. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, sure. Th thank you, Douglas and Gail. Another wonderful tour and uh, so interesting to see how different uh, things are compared to the last time. Uh, that we did this a uh, couple of months and what a big difference. Uh, so we'll get to the questions and of course if anyone uh, has questions now for Douglas and or Gail, uh, please type them into the Q&A panel and we'll get to as many of them as we can. Uh, so first one comes in, uh, does the cactus bear edible fruits like the Mediterranean ones, the cactus pears? Yeah, good, good question. Uh, the common name of the Opunta is prickly pear. 
And although I've had the fruit develop, I've never been able to have the fruit develop to a point where it's actually harvestable and edible. So again, I can, I can, in Ontario, I can take it up to just a certain point, And after that, uh, um, the winter sets in. So I think the growing season is just too short for the fruit uh, to develop. And interestingly, you'll find populations of Apuntia in uh, various places throughout Ontario and Canada. One of the largest populations I saw was on uh, Peely, Point Peely. Um, so again, I think it's just the growing season, the length of the growing season as to what, how far you can grow the plant before it goes dormant. Okay, next question seems to be more uh, for Gail. Uh, if spinach or other greens are flowering, but the leaves aren't as big as normal, should we cut the flowers off and let the leaves grow more, or are the leaves done growing by the flowering point? Yeah, once you're, that's called bolting again. Spinach is a cold weather crop, so it's only really good in May to early June, and then if you want to plant it again, you plant it in August, so it's, so it's cold. Um, so it's cold water crop. Uh, okay, turn it around. Sorry. Okay. So um, once they once they bolt like that, you they're not gonna they're not gonna mature any further. Whatever leaves are there, you can take them, you can use them, you can, you can cook with them. But once they go to seed, harvest the seed, and that's it. That's it for the end of the plant, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, earlier we talked about uh, plants that were being tipped. Uh, how do you know which plants can be tipped? How many? How do we know which plants can be what? Tipped. Tipped. Yeah, a lot of that is uh, experimentation and just um, just experience. Uh, there's lots of information online, but the general rule of thumb is that it, it, if it is long, lanky, and the tissue itself is still soft and supple, then it could be tipped. So I wouldn't tip um, a woody plant, but I would tip um, anything that was soft and fleshy. Although having said that, when I tip the ewes or other evergreens, one might say, well, they're not soft, they're not su supple, they're actually kind of woody. Well, that's true. Uh, so one would never tip a plant where there are no buds below where you tipped it. There are certain pines, for example, that if you remove that growing tip, there will not be any dormant buds that emerge below that. So you have to know a little bit about your plants as to which ones have dormant buds and which ones do not. Once you know that, then it's a matter of the right timing. In other words, you wouldn't want to tip the plant um, in late summer or fall if it takes more weeks than you have for it to reestablish and flower. So it's all a matter of timing. The timing, it has to be there. So we generally will do it early in the season, which means May-ish. Uh, and then sometimes if it's a late flowering perennial, we will tip it a second time. Uh, chrysanthemums is a great example where they are so vigorous in their growth that uh, we will tip them twice in order to get them to uh, bush out. Now, commercial greenhouses, don't tip them. They don't have somebody walking around tipping. They've got chemicals and growth regulators which do that for them. But of course, we, uh, we're, we are eco-gardeners, uh, so we do it mechanically just by uh, the two-finger technique. Okay, uh, next question about uh, the alkalinity of soil in a flower bed. So how would you test for the alkalinity of soil in a flower bed? Yeah, um, that's actually called soil pH. Um, that's a really interesting question uh, because you've got to get uh, the right pH on your soil. Um, soil or, or the pH scale goes from one to 14, seven being neutral. So the soil that we've added here, and we get this from a, one of the commercial uh, suppliers. I actually went there with one of Riverwood's uh, pH meters, made up a little mix, uh, taking some of the soil, adding some water, and then um, did a pH measurement. And it actually was just below uh, seven. So that's neutral and that's, that's great. On the other hand, if you were growing rhododendron, here's one example of 
rhododendron, which is a beautiful uh, flowering plant. Um, in fact, the Riverwood, they're in their glory right now. If you ever get a chance to go up the Riverwood, the back of the chapel house, so many of the, of the rhododendron are in flower now. But these plants require acidic acid uh, pH, somewhere between four, five, and five. And in order to acidify the soil, there are products that you can use. What we've typically used is I, I add some sulfur, uh, which farmers have been using for eons. And I also take, they might all be gone by now. Oh, there we go. So uh, our pine trees produce these, uh, these needles. And you, well, evergreens, right? There's, there's always, they're always green. Yeah, that's true. But every year they turn over their needles or their leaves. And so I take these needles and I add them to the soil at the base of the rhododendron. And that helps to acidify the soil. You really need to know whether your plants want it neutral, alkaline, or acidic, and then you can mend the soil accordingly. The tomatoes, for example, like it a bit alkaline, and most, most garden uh, plants do like it neutral. But if you want to grow blueberries, for example, you've got to acidify. Yeah, blueberries are another good example. Thank you, Gail. Um, you know, just look at the plants that are growing up in the Canadian Shield. That soil is relatively acidic. Um, and blueberries abound as do conifers. <laughs> okay. Uh, but there's also, there are also, sorry, there are also these uh, pH, these little pH uh, meters that you can buy from a uh, garden center. You can just stick them in the ground and it'll give you an indication of soil pH. Thank you for that. Answer a couple of uh, trimming or pruning questions now coming your way. Uh, first one, uh, should daffodil leaves be trimmed down once it has stooped, stopped flowering? Yeah, uh, also a good question. So at Riverwood, I used to have the volunteers take the leaves and gently bend them over and then tie them uh, just so you don't have these um, greeny yellow leaves remaining in the garden. That was so labor intensive. So um, we do it if, we, if, if it's a prominent area and if it's not a prominent area, we just let the leaves go yellow. The key there is if you know that you're gonna be planting daffodils, or alliums for that matter, the leaves do get yellow and grotty looking. So plant something else around it. So as that other plant grows, the leaves are beginning to fade. Um, now I've also just pruned off the daffodil leaves. And I must say, I can't, I can't say with 100% certainty that it actually does affect the bulb, especially once the leaves are turning yellow. I do leave all the daffodil leaves when they're green, but as they start to get a little yellow, then you can trim them and it has no impact on the flower the flowers next year. Got it. And uh, on to pruning, uh, specifically for tomato plants. Uh, so should you prune tomato plants if flowers are few, but they're still growing higher? So, um there are two types of tomato plants. They are determinate, which just stop. They don't go any taller. And there's indeterminate that will grow 12, 14 feet tall, particularly cherry tomatoes. Um, I think it's not a bad idea to, what I always do is come August, you don't want any more flowers starting in August because there's not enough time in the season for the, for the flowers to create fruit that will ripen on time. So in August, I tip all my tomatoes. If you have a problem with your tomato growing, but there's not a lot of flower underneath, I don't think tipping is going to do it because you need, you need the vigor of the plant to generate the energy to make the flowers. So I would tip tomatoes in August. Um, and, and, and other than that, don't take the top off. Take the suckers out. What are the suckers? If, you don't, if, you're, if you're not getting a lot of flowers, what might happen is you have a stem and you have the major branch coming out. Between the branch and the stem is a little piece of green. It wants to become another branch. And those don't flower. And if you have your tomatoes getting really bushy with these suckers between the stem and the main branch, take those out. Take those out and check for them almost every day at this time of year because that will sap the, the plant from producing flowers. And that might be what, is, what some of the problem is if you have a tall plant with no flowers. It may be full of these suckers. The other possibility is that you're uh, giving it too much nitrogen. 
fertilizer uh, is such that if you give your plant a lot of nitrogen, particularly uh, vegetables, you're going to get a lot of leaf and not much fruit. So when you apply your fertilizer, if you're not using compost, you're applying fertilizer, not using uh, compost. Make sure that that first number, which is the nitrogen number, is lower than the uh, the second number, which is uh, phosphorus. It's always nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. So again, if you're getting a lot of leaf and not much flower, make sure it's it could be your fertilizer. Make sure that first number is low for vegetables relative to the others. And now a couple of uh, lilac questions uh, on the way. So first one, uh, someone who has a French lilac shrub uh, that's not going to live much longer, unfortunately. Uh, so do you have a recommendation for a flowering shrub for privacy that grows up to about eight feet? So lots of privacy needed here. A flowering shrub that goes how tall? Eight feet. Eight feet. Is it uh, a sunny or shady area? Where are lilac trees? Is it, is it growing in the same area that the lilac was? I'm going to guess it's in the same place that where the lilac shrub was before. Okay. Um, two possibil a number of possibilities. One is try another lilac. Lilacs really are a lovely addition to any garden. You could try a, um, a Circus canadensis, a red bud. You can try different viburnums. And you could also try, believe it or not, Forsythia. Forsythia, like that, the first shrub that uh, flowers in the spring, the yellow flowers, like they will easily go eight to uh, eight feet tall. Um, and you can prune them into continue that graceful form. So again, viburnums, other lilacs, uh, Circus canadensis, the red bud, um, the uh, Forsythia are some of the examples I could think of right, right off the top. The other shrubs that will do well in that kind of uh, exposure and get around that height. Uh, there are some Dutzias, a white flowering shrub that are lovely. Uh, an old fashioned um, beauty bush will also get around eight feet tall. Um, so again, a lot of examples of flowering shrubs that will stay in the same area as the lilac and stay around uh, eight feet or so. Just be careful about when you prune them in order to ensure that you get flowers the following year. So funny that you mentioned pruning lilacs because that leads us nicely into the next question, which is what is the best time to prune lilac trees and what's the right way to do it? Well, why don't, I, why don't we walk over to the garden and I'll show you. It's Excellent actually, idea. It's actually right now. <laughs> I just gave it away. Now is the best time to be pruning. After they flower. Here and here's go. Douglas to show you how to do it. So this is the um, a standard uh, lilac. This is the classic uh, purple lilac. And you could see that um, we had a, a profusion of flowers this year. So once the lilac, or actually any shrub, uh, finishes flowering, that's the time to prune it. So in this case, I would take my, second, my pruners and I would snip off this entire structure. So this whole thing would come off. And that way, all the energy from the plant goes back into leaf, back into photosynthesis, and it doesn't uh, get sucked up by the, by the flowers. Um, so now is the time of the year to be pruning your, your lilacs. Why can't you do it later, Douglas? So if you prune the lilac- Like in the fall. In the fall, you will not have flowers the next year. The lilac requires the new season's growth in order to flower on next year. So if in fact you prune this in October or November, the plant will not have time to produce new growth on which it will flower next year. Now, you just gotta be careful about what it is that you're pruning and when. Again, lots of information online. But again, the lilac is one example of a plant that you must prune it. Again, I would just prune it right here about a centimeter above where a branch is coming out. <clears throat> and that'll guarantee flowers for next year. Nice. Uh, so a question now from someone who has uh, white scales growing on a uh, rose shrub. What could be the cause of those white scales? And is there yeah, a way to, be, it could way be to just address that? that? It could be, yeah, it could be scale. 
Um, scale is a, a very nasty insect, uh, a sucking insect. It could be a mealybug. Uh, it could be uh, aphids. Uh, there's a number of insects that will go after roses. And they really like uh, the growth at this time of the year because it's soft, succulent um, to an insect, that is. Um, and sometimes they will literally just swarm all over the growing parts of the plant, uh, including the buds. So there are um, methods of controlling uh, the insect. Uh, there's there's um, a dormant oil and, and uh, safer's oil. What we do up at Riverwood, uh, because we do everything without uh, pesticides, <clears throat> uh, we do two things. One is that we'll go along with a hose and we'll literally, literally blast the insect off the, off the uh, foliage, but not so vigorously that you damage the leaves. Uh, the other thing that we do, um, although we can't do it this year, is that we have a lot of high school students doing their volunteer work and they will hand pick or hand remove uh, these insects on a regular basis. So again, roses are fussy, uh, insects are attracted to them, uh, and the white, unless I saw an actual picture, I couldn't tell you exactly what it was. If you wanna send us a picture, I can diagnose it, uh, but it, it sounds like one of the standard um, insects that will attack roses. Back to the lilacs quickly for one moment, uh, sort of a follow-up question, what if the lilac is too tall to prune? So if, if your lilac is really tall and you want to, you want to take it down uh, substantially, you can do that. That's similar to what I did with the uh, viburnum. Um, so I pruned that viburnum uh, late fall, but I knew that it wouldn't be, that I, I would be cutting off the flowers for next year. Um, so you can do it at any, at any time of the year. And in fact, if you want to get radical with your lilac, Let's say it's 10 feet and you want to start it back at, at three feet or two feet. You can do that. There is a risk. Uh, but if you do that in the fall and you take out some of those major stems, especially, so you take out the really thick stems from your lilac and that will encourage new vigorous growth uh, from the bottom to replace those thick uh, woody stems. Okay, since we're running a little bit uh, short on time here, last couple of questions, and these are, I think, both uh, directed towards Gail. So, and I've got this one to grab the camera and uh, move it back towards Gail. Uh, questions about the vegetable garden. So, first of all, uh, how do you suppress weeds in the vegetable garden because there didn't appear to be a lot of mulch? And second, uh, kind of a common question, how do you keep the squirrels and the raccoons from getting at the plants? <laughs> okay, so... The age-old question. <laughs> yes. So the, the trick with weeds is doing it now, doing it every day. I don't mulch my vegetable garden, but you can certainly put down straw. That's a really good suppressant. I just simply go out with a hoe or down by hand, with my hands. You see the size of it. It's not unmanageable. Um, and well, I'll, I'll be doing this every day. These don't belong in the garden. So if you just keep, if you made it, make it sort of a Zen thing to do every day, um, give it an hour every day to, to pick it by hand, it really is manageable. If you let it get out of hand now, the weeds will flower and seed, and then you have a real mess on your hands. As for rodents, this is interesting. Um, I, have tr I have tried cayenne pepper, I have tried pet hair, I have actually, the most foolproof way, but the most tedious way is an electric fence where it's electric wire, and you just wire it around the areas that the animals like to eat and it's electrified by a rechargeable battery that you have to change maybe once a week and recharge. You also have to know what pests go after. Your tomatoes, your peppers, your eggplants tend not to be so delicious. They love the beans and peas and salads. And so if you planted those in one area and then proofed that area, that's one way. The other way, is this way. What on earth is that? It looks like a bit of a bulb. Remember when we showed you the giant alliums? What happens with those giant flowering alliums is after about four or five years, they, they make a lot of foliage, but they don't produce a flower. 
And what Douglas actually taught me when he went on a trip to Chicago is that the rodents don't like the alliums. So what I've started doing, and it's been incredibly successful, is I have it in my salad patch, I have it around my beans, I have it around my soybeans, and they are not being touched at all. A substitute for that, if you don't grow the giant alliums, would be just really cheap, horrible garlic. Like not the really expensive, delicious garlic that we grow in Ontario, but just cheap, horrible garlic that you chop up in pieces and sprinkle it all over your garden. You won't really smell it, but it will really keep the rodents away. Do you, in that case, do you actually break open the, uh, the cloves? Yeah, cut the, cut the whole garlic head right in half and put those halves of the garlic head into your garden. And you might want to do that a couple of times during the year because they will wither after a time. Gail, I also noticed that you've got all this white stuff uh, in the garden. Uh, which look, what are those? Oh, the, you mean the eggshells? Oh, is that what they are? Yeah. So if you uh, love your tomatoes and you get floss men rot, sometimes that black rotting at the base, that could be, it could be from a number of conditions, lack of water, but it could be lack of calcium. And the best way to get calcium in, in your garden is to sh save all the eggshells that you have week by week, dry them a little, crumble them up, throw them in the garden, and they decompose slowly and put the calcium into the soil and the tomatoes love it great tip a fantastic tip and a wonderful way to wrap up another edition of ask the expert gardener so douglas and gail uh fantastic job once again uh, the garden the greenhouse looking wonderful and uh thank you so much for sharing your expertise with everyone who asked questions You're welcome today. You're very and, welcome thank you. and to thank everyone you. who joined us today thank you so much we do appreciate your time and uh if you want to support us in having more of these kind of webinars and of course we are trying to come back strong once we have COVID restrictions uh, lifted uh, around Ontario. We of course would very much appreciate your support. You can give today at the riverwoodconservancy.org slash donate and help us come back strong once we get uh, a little bit more normalcy back in our lives. So we hope to see you again soon. So Douglas and Gail, thank you once more and uh, for everyone for joining us today, thank you. Stay safe and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy your gardens.